Cool, thank you. So as Charles said, today I'm going to be talking to you about toy models of holographic duality. So I guess the first thing we need to cover is what are holographic dualities and why are we interested in studying toy models of them. Now the motivation for studying holographic dualities really comes from high energy physics, where there's a principle that states a quantum gravity theory living in d plus one dimensional space time is equivalent to a non-gravitational theory living on the boundary of that space time. And this is a general principle which is expected to hold for any theory of quantum gravity, but the most well-studied manifestation of this principle is the ADS-CFT correspondence. And the ADS-CFT correspondence is a conjectured duality between quantum gravity theories living in anti-Jupiter space and conformal field theories living on the boundary of that space. This is a correspondence that's been well studied for a number of years, but quantum gravity is complicated, conformal field theories are complicated, and for that reason it's quite difficult to do exact rigorous calculations within this theory. But recently it was uh, noticed that there's some interesting, um, interesting links between concepts in quantum information theory and concepts in ADS-CFT. And that's led over the past few years to people constructing toy models of ADS-CFT using concepts from quantum information theory. What we've done in this work is we've constructed the first toy model, which is a duality on the level of local Hamiltonians. So why is this important? Well, previous toy models were very useful for studying static um, features of this duality. But because they didn't have access to Hamiltonians, they weren't used to study time dynamics or energy scales. And what we've got here is we've been able to construct a duality on the level of local Hamiltonians, and that allows us to extend previous toy models of holography to cover energy scales and time dynamics. So it gives us access to some new features of the duality that we can look into. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background. So in particular, I'll give a very brief introduction to the ADS-CFT correspondence for those of you who aren't familiar. And then I'm going to talk about the HAPI code. And the HAPI code is one of these earlier toy models um, of the ADS-CFT co ADS correspondence, and it's one we build on in, in our work. I'm then going to talk about Hamiltonian simulation theory, and that's kind of the added ingredient we have in our toy model that allows us to extend the earlier toy models. Once I've gone through this, I'm going to give you a sketch of some of the techniques we use in our, in our work before finally talking about some of the applications of our construction. So what is the ADS-CFT correspondence? Well, as I said, it's a duality between a quantum gravity theory and leaving an anti -to space where anti to sitter space is um, maximally symmetric space with constant negative curvature. So that's what we have in the bulk here of this picture. And on the boundary, we have a conformal field theory. What do I mean by saying there's a duality? Well, every state in the bulk maps to some state in the boundary and vice versa. If you take local operators living somewhere in the bulk and take the limit of those operators as you take uh, the radial coordinate out to infinity, you find that these bulk operators are equal to local uh, boundary operators. So that's all fine, but why should, we, why should we be interested in this as quantum information theorists? Well, it's been shown that you can think of AD, the ADS-CFT correspondence as acting like a quantum error correcting code. So how does this work? Well, what you need to do to consider this as a quantum error correcting code, you consider the bulk Hilbert space, so this is the space where the quantum gravity theory is living. This is the logical Hilbert space for your error correcting code. The boundary Hilbert space, so that's where the uh, conformal field theory lives. This is the physical Hilbert space of your code. So the information about the bulk physics is redundantly encoded in the boundary physics in such a way that you can delete parts of your boundary system and still reconstruct all of the bulk physics. But ADS-CFT is an error correcting code with quite interesting recovery properties. And in particular, operators that live near the center of the bulk are better protected from erasures than operators that, living, that live near the boundary of, the, of this uh, system. So that's a very, very brief introduction to ADS-CFT. How are we going to construct toy models of this using concepts from quantum information theory? Well, the HAPI code, which is, as I said, the code we, we uh, build on in our work, is a tensor network toy model of ADS-CFT. And the building blocks of this tensor network a type of tensor known as perfect tensors, where a perfect tensor is defined as a tensor which is an isometry across any bipartition. So this is quite a demanding definition, and it's not immediately obvious that any interesting examples of perfect tensors should exist. But it's been shown that, in fact, there are interesting examples of these tensors, and they're actually closely related to lots of other interesting concepts in quantum information theory. So the one that's particularly useful for our purposes and why these are useful in toy models of ADS-CFT is that perfect tensors are encoding isometries for optimal quantum error correcting codes. So that's why you, there's this link between these types of tensors and ADS-CFT viewed as a quantum error correcting code. 
So these are the building blocks of our tensor network, well, of the Happy Papers tensor network. How do they put them together to get a toy model of ads -CFT? The idea is actually surprisingly, surprisingly simple. What you do is you take a tessellation of the hyperbolic plane here by pentagons, and you place a six-leg perfect tensor in each pentagon. Five legs of the perfect tensor are contracted with indices of neighboring tensors, and one leg is left uncontracted. So these uncontracted legs living in the bulk, these are our, these are our bulk degrees of freedom. You cut the tensor network off at some finite radius, and the uncontracted tensor indices living on the boundary, these are the boundary degrees of freedom. And what you can show using the properties of this tessellation, along with the properties of the perfect tensor, is that this tensor network is an isometry from the bulk degrees of freedom to the boundary degrees of freedom. So in that sense, you know, there's an isometry mapping these two Hilbert spaces, so there's a duality between them. But there's more as well. Again, using the properties of the tessellation and the properties of the perfect tensor, you can show that this tensor network is an error-correcting code. And just like in ADS-CFT, you find that operators near the center, living in the center of this tessellation, are better protected from a range of boundary degrees of freedom than operators living near the boundary. So you can get the idea that this is some of the qualitative features of ADS-CFT. And in fact, there's some other features of ADS-CFT that I've left out here because of time constraints, but that this tensor network model also captures. So in that sense, this is a nice toy model. But what happens if we try and apply about a Hamiltonian to the bulk degrees of freedom and map it out to the boundary, degree, boundary degrees of freedom? What you find is that if you have a local Hamiltonian on the bulk degrees of freedom and you map it out to the boundary, the resulting boundary Hamiltonian is completely non-local. So there are global terms acting on the entire boundary at once. And that's problematic for a number of reasons. Firstly, you don't expect conformal field theories to have global Hamiltonians. And secondly, and perhaps more seriously, a global Hamiltonian has lost all relationship to the geometry of the spins it's acting on. There's no real sense in which it, a global Hamiltonian acting on this boundary system is acting in one dimension. And the dimensionality of this duality is an important feature of it, so we really want to capture that in the mapping between Hamiltonians. So how are we going to move on from here? Well, we're going to do that using a theory, the theory of Hamiltonian simulation. What do I mean by saying one Hamiltonian simulates another? Well, what I really mean is it, re it ca captures all the physics of that Hamiltonian. So if Hamiltonian H prime simulates Hamiltonian H, it reproduces the static, dynamic, and thermodynamic properties of H. So in a paper last year, Hubert, Montanaro, and Piddick put this on a really rigorous footing. So they defined exactly what these conditions mean, and moreover, they determined the forms that maps between Hamiltonians have to have to meet these conditions. And then they went further, and they showed that all Hamiltonians that you can write down can be simulated by certain simple 2D spin lattice models using a simulation technique known as perturbation gadgets. So maybe you can begin to see where this is going now. This raises a question. Can we use these simulation techniques along with a holographic quantum error correcting code from a 3D bulk to a 2D boundary to construct a toy model of holographic duality where the mapping of Hamiltonians now maps local Hamiltonians to local Hamiltonians? And the answer obviously is yes, because otherwise I wouldn't be giving this talk. So in this section, I'm just going to give a very brief overview of some of the techniques we used to try and give you a flavor of the way the construction works. But I won't go into any details here, so don't worry. So the first thing we need to do to make this construction work is to generalize the happy code up from a two-dimensional bulk to a three-dimensional bulk. And the reason we need to do that is because the simulation techniques we're going to use require us to have a 2D boundary, which means having a 3D bulk. So the first thing to do is to take some tessellations of hyperbolic three space and analyze them. Now in the happy code, the way they analyze the tessellations of hyperbolic two space is really by inspection. They can generate images of these uh, tessellations and determine their properties by looking at them. But when you try and do something similar in three dimensions, you end up with pictures like this and you really can't get any useful information out of these kind of images. And the problem is only gonna get worse if you try and generalize these theories to higher dimensions, which you might want to do. So for that reason, what we need is an analytic way to get a handle on, these, on the properties of these tessellations. And we do that using the theory of Coxeter groups. So a Coxeter polytope is defined as a polytope which has all its dihedral angles integer submultiples of pi. And these polytopes are interesting because they tessellate the space they live in. So in particular, if we have a Coxeter polytope living in hyperbolic three space, that polytope will tessellate hyperbolic three space. And importantly, these Coxeter polytopes define geometric reflection groups. So the way that works is you take the generators of this reflection group to be um, reflections in the facets of your polytope. 
The relations between these generators are set, are, can be calculated from the dihedral angles between different facets. And why is this useful? Well, it turns out you can, um, you can really determine all the properties of, the, of your tessellation just by studying the combinatorics of this group. So you don't have to worry about trying to visualize high hyperbolic three space or even higher dimensional hyperbolic spaces. You can just write down your group and using you know, very powerful techniques, determine all the properties of your tessellation. So once we've got these Cox to group techniques behind us, we can move forward with constructing this tensor network model. So what do we do? Well, we build a tensor network out of stabilizer perfect tensors, which are just perfect tensors which describe stabilizer quantum error correcting codes. These are embedded in a tessellation of H3 by a Cox to polytope. Again, just in the happy code, one index of the perfect tensor is uncontracted. This is our bulk index. The other indices are contracted with net tensors in neighboring polytopes. Again, we cut the tessellation off at some finite radius, and the uncontracted tensor legs living on the boundary, these are our boundary degrees of freedom. And we can derive all the properties of this tensor network from the Cox to group and the perfect tensor. And in particular, we can show that this tensor network has the same property, provided we choose the right Cox to group, this tensor network has the same properties as the happy code in terms of the properties that map to properties of ADS CFT. Okay, but all we've done here is just map the happy code upper dimension. We don't have a Hamiltonian yet, so how are we gonna add that in? So there's two steps to this. Before we go on to a local Hamiltonian, we're first gonna construct a duality from a local Hamiltonian in the bulk to a non-local Hamiltonian in the boundary. This non-local boundary Hamiltonian has two terms in it. This first term here, H overline bulk, this is just the encoded version of the bulk Hamiltonian. So in quantum error correcting language, this is the logical operator which corresponds to our bulk Hamiltonian. This H penalty here, you don't need to worry about the exact form of it, but it's just a um, Hamiltonian that gives energy at least one to all states, boundary states, which live outside the code space. And both H bulk and H penalty, we can show are very non-local, just as they were in the happy paper. And delta S here is some large parameter which we can pick in our construction. Now, it turns out this is an, this is an example of a perfect simulation in the language of Qubit, Montanaro, and Piddick. So what that means is that this Hamiltonian living on the boundary, it completely captures all the physics of the Hamiltonian living in the bulk. But it's non-local, so how do we move forward? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the techniques that are used in the Qubit, Montanaro, and Piddick paper are a type of simulation technique known as a perturbation gadget. And these are the same techniques that we're going to use here. So the first perturbation gadget we use is a subdivision gadget. And what this does is it takes a k-local Hamiltonian and it breaks it down into a k over two local Hamiltonian. So this interaction pattern here on the left is simulated by the interaction pattern on the right. And what we have is that where there was a k-local homo- k interaction between sets of qubits A and B, we now have a k over two local interaction. But we've introduced an extra qubit in order to mediate this interaction. So we can do- apply these subdivision gadgets repeatedly to this highly non-local Hamiltonian. And what we end up with is a two-local Hamiltonian. But this Hamiltonian has, this, the interaction graph of this Hamiltonian contains a number of crossings. So it's not planar, so again, it doesn't really live in two dimensions. But fortunately, there's another simulation technique we can use, which is now a crossing gadget. And again, the interaction pattern on the left is simulated by the interaction pattern on the right. And again, this crossing that we didn't want in our interaction graph, we've managed to get rid of it. But the penalty for doing so is that we've introduced another extra qubit in the interaction graph. So we can again apply this repeatedly, and we end up with a planar Hamiltonian. The final thing we use is a fork gadget, and we just use this to reduce the degree of all uh, the vertices in the interaction graph. So once we've applied all the simulation techniques, what we end up with is a uh, nearest neighbor planar graph with constant interaction degree. We then use a few slightly more advanced simulation techniques from the same paper, and the final boundary Hamiltonian we end up with is a Hamiltonian of this form. So it's two local, nearest neighbor, planar interaction graph. It's also got full SU2 local symmetry. The Hilbert space this uh, Hamiltonian is living on is a triangulation of a surface M. So this surface M is homomorphic to a two-sphere, and it's a distance log log N from the bulk qubits. And the reason this distance is important is because we've added lots of extra qubits in our um, simulation techniques, and it would be reasonable to ask how much we've blown up the Hilbert space of our um, of our boundary system. Is it really still a boundary? And the answer is we have blown it up, but only a little bit, so it really is still a boundary. So that's a very brief overview to our techniques, and I'm going to talk about some of the applications of the construction. So the first thing that having a Hamiltonian gives you access to is energy scales. 
And one of the most interesting energy scales in ADS-CFT is the energy scale on the boundary that corresponds to black holes in the bulk. In the happy paper, they suggest you can model black holes in the bulk by removing a tensor from the tensor network. And they gave a number of reasons why this is a reasonable way to, to model black holes. But what they couldn't do is say anything about the energy scales of these black holes. And what we've shown in our paper is that in our model, these are dual to high energy boundary states, just as you'd expect in ADS-CFT. But we can then go further and actually look at how do these black holes form in the bulk. So to do that, we need to pick a particular bulk Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian we pick is a local Hamiltonian which models semi-classical gravity. We also need to set the delta S parameter in our Hamiltonian. And what we choose is that delta S is greater than the norm of these local terms, but less than the sum over, the, sum over these norms across the entire tensor network. So we start in the ground state of our bulk system. And what we do is we apply some local bulk excitations to a shell of matter living near the um, boundary of our system. And because of the way we've set up the um, delta S parameter in our code, what we have is that the energy of this system is greater than delta S. We then allow the system to evolve under our um, Hamiltonian H bulk. And because this Hamiltonian model is semi-classical gravity, what's going to happen is that this shell of excitation or this shell of matter is going to fall inwards. Eventually, we'll end up with this uh, in a state where most of the spins are in the ground state and it's just an order one number of um, spins in an excited state. Now the evolution has been unitary so we must still have energy greater than delta S but we can't pick this up from order one bulk terms because of the way we've set up the construction. And what we show in our paper is that the only way to conserve energy under unitary dynamics is to violate a stabiliser term and this is equivalent to removing a tensor from the tensor network. So we've shown that the, happy, the way they model the black holes in the happy code really is the right way to think about them. And in the paper, we discuss a bit more what this says about um, how we should view the boundary and the tensor network. Um, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to move on swiftly. So the other thing we are able to do uh, using our techniques is construct a mapping from the boundary to the bulk. So throughout this talk, I've spoken about ADS-CFT as if it's a map from bulk to boundary. But in fact, it's a map that goes in both directions. And in fact, the boundary to bulk direction is actually in many ways a more interesting direction. And what we're able to do in our paper is to construct a map in this direction. And the way we do that is by decomposing the boundary Hilbert space um, into subspaces corresponding to different configurations of black holes in the bulk. And that allows us to define a map going from the boundary to the bulk. So to conclude, what we've done here is we've constructed a toy model of holographic duality where the bulk boundary mapping is between local Hamiltonians. And this allows us to incorporate energy scales and di time dynamics into the toy model, and also allows us to construct a map from the boundary to the bulk, which is a new direction for these uh, toy models. So thank you for your attention. Is there any questions for the speaker? So, sorry if this is perhaps a trivial question, um, but I was just wondering, uh, so you showed explicitly the boundary Hamiltonian, and um, I see that it's frustrated, but I was just wondering if there's anything known about the gap of that Hamiltonian? Um, so the gap of the Hamiltonian will depend on the gap of the bulk Hamiltonian, because this is a simulation, the spectrum of the, below the energy cut of delta S, the spectrum of the boundary will match the spectrum of the bulk. So it can basically be whatever you choose by choosing your bulk Hamiltonian. I see, okay, thanks. Uh, other questions? Okay, I have a quick question. Um, so we know in holography that these tensor, perfect tensor constructions, they don't really produce the correct entanglement spectrum that you expect from CFTs. So what kind of features do you think can be reproduced in your model and what kind of features cannot be reproduced in your model? So this is kind of going to be similar to the happy code. So again, if we don't allow for there to be bulk degrees of freedom and just look at holographic states rather than holographic codes, we can reproduce the entanglement spectrum of ADS-CFT. But obviously there we don't have the, um, we don't have the, 
error correcting properties, so you can't get both at once using perfect tenses. But what we could do, um, in a similar way as we have done for other tensor network constructions, is replace perfect tenses with the random tenses. And although we haven't kind of gone through the proof in detail and checked, we think that provided you use random stabilizer tenses, not just completely random tenses, um, all our proof would go through. And then you do get the entanglement properties that you expect up to epsilons um, in the same way as you do for the random tensor construction in 2D. OK. Thank you. Uh, more questions? All right. If there is no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.